Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jeremiah DeGullen, Solutions Advisor for the Center for Professional and Executive Development, and I'm excited to have you with us as we hear from Sean Belling about why and how to rethink the purpose of your physical office. Before I introduce Sean, I'd like to share a few words about the Wisconsin School of Business Center for Professional and Executive Development, or CPED for short. CPED offers online and in-person programs and certificates that will give you the modern, relevant skills needed to advance in your career. All of our programs offer interactive learning sessions facilitated by instructors with practical business experience. CPED also partners with organizations to provide customized professional development programs, coaching, and consulting. For more information about the Center for Professional and Executive Development, please join our website at uwcped.org. If you have any questions during today's presentation, you that uh, you can go ahead and submit those questions using either the chat or the Q&A buttons on the bottom of the Zoom webinar screen. We will post questions that are submitted during the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. I will also want to mention that today's webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be made available within the next few days. Now, I'd like to introduce Sean Belling. <clears throat> Welcome, Sean. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So Sean is, uh, is a globally experienced technology executive, project management speaker, and instructor, author based in Madison, Wisconsin. Sean holds a doctorate in education from the University of the Cumberlands, and he has held <clears throat> executive and management roles in higher education, software, consulting, biopharma, manufacturing, and regulatory compliance sectors. In addition to over 28 years of technology and project leadership experience, Sean teaches, speaks, and consults for businesses, universities, and professional organizations. Sean released a book, Succeeding with Agile Hybrids in November of 2020, and is preparing to release his second book, Remotely Possible, this summer. Sean, thanks for joining us today. I'll pass it on over to you. Jeremiah, thanks so much. Um, uh, my uh, book, Remotely Possible, actually came out last summer, so um, it's out there. Uh, if you uh, search for me, you'll be able to find a copy of it. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon uh, traces back to my experience um, thinking about that book and then ultimately putting it together. And a lot of that experience I'm going to talk about here in just a moment. But first, you know, some of the things I hope uh, you'll all come away from our time together this afternoon and hopefully some of the reasons you joined. You know, we'll talk a little bit about the concept of work and you know, what is work. Uh, as it applies to certain professions and work types, because we always acknowledge that there are some things you have to be present to do. So let's get that on the table right away. Another key takeaway, this idea of productivity and creativity being, again, something that happens in so many places and not just in a designated physical space. And that takes us into a couple of other key elements, which is you know, talking about the necessity, the need to reimagine physical space, given where we are in December of 2022. Say that again with me. It's December of 2022. We're coming up on three solid years of COVID times, which is hard to believe. But it's changed things so much for a lot of people. And one of the, the key to uh, topics for this afternoon is what does that mean for the future of the physical space? And then that takes us in uh, to a discussion of some ideas on how we imagine space, not just for the near term, but also for the future. Before I get into that, I, I want to th uh, think for a minute and share with you as I was preparing for the talk this afternoon and you know, going through my slides and uh, updating my notes, I, th I got to thinking a little bit about one of the first spaces I had ever seen that was reimagined for a remote and a hybrid workplace. I joined a company in January of uh, 2012, coming up on 10 years ago, a company 
was called EDL Consulting slash Cloud Craze. And it was called that because it was a consulting firm that had its roots in the early 2000s, post first dot com crash. And then in the, uh, the late 2000s, 0809, it had spun up uh, a product, a business to business e-commerce product that was called Cloud Craze. Now it's known as uh, Salesforce B2B Commerce. So it had a pretty good run and a pretty good exit. But what I think about is my first experience in that office space and getting a chance to see it. It was in, in Deerfield, Illinois, and um, you know, not, not a huge uh, space. We're, we're talking about, I think, maybe three private offices, a reception desk, um, a nice kind of glass wall conference room with, with what was then, keep in mind, 10 years ago, the latest in uh, video conferencing technical capabilities to plug in a lot of laptops and do demos. Um, a gigantic glass wall that was a whiteboard, the entire wall we could write on, and then um, a big open space in the middle. And the open space is the, the part that I think about, that in the conference room, because in that open space was um, space for basically 20 people to sit at once. Maybe it was more like 16, but in any case, it was almost like a bench. And at each bench was an arm that supported dual monitors and then there were cables there so one could plug in a Mac or a PC laptop and have instant access to the dual monitors, a place to sit. And uh, again, when the, the space was full, we could accommodate a number of people um, all sitting in that space. But when, uh, as was normally the case, this was a remote first company, um, the space could be repurposed. And you know, thinking about that further, the founder of this company uh, is a guy named Bill Lumperitas. And when we talk about reimagining the physical office space, and I was thinking about the, the space I just described to you, I think about a conversation I had with Bill. We were downtown Chicago at a place, I think it was called the Kenzie Steakhouse. Um, and it, it, interestingly, Bill was able to sort of turn and look over his shoulder and point um, out the window, roughly to the location of the first office. Uh, first office space he had leased in downtown Chicago when he founded his company. And, you know, one of the things he talked about was, you know, the, the realization as his company grew that that kind of office space was really expensive. And between the recognition that he was building a company where he could hire the best people, regardless of where they were, they lived um, and they could work anywhere. And that, you know, rather than have expensive downtown Chicago real estate, why not have it one, a little bit closer where he lived and two in a, a part of the greater Chicago area that was a lot less expensive uh, was a good move financially, but then also to be able to take that space and reimagine it for a remote first workforce. So I um, wanted to share that story with you as we got, got rolling here this afternoon, because that is so informative to my own experience and a lot of what I'll, I'll share with you and a lot of what I talked about in my book, Remotely Possible. Um, Hopefully we're, we're teed up to do a poll, but if we're not, um, hey, go ahead and post your, your responses in the chat. Um, interested in, and let me preface this by saying um, I, I've done uh, other webinars on remote work with CPAD. And I know we've posed this question previously, either in late 2021 or maybe in early 2022. So now I'm curious to see where people are at. Um, you know, what are your organization's plans for remote work in the coming year? We looking at maximum remote flexibility? Are we looking at a hybrid? Are we looking at maximum return to the physical office? So, um, yeah, look at the look at the responses compiling in. We see lots and lots of hybrid. Yeah. Oh, we'll see a max return to the office. Hybrid will stay that way. Um, and there's a poll that just went up too. So if you uh, also want to respond to that, it'd be interesting to see some percentages. So. Let's, uh, let's wait a second while people respond. All right. So hopefully people have had a chance to vote. Um, wonder if we can see the results. 
There we go. Look at that. 78% overwhelmingly hybrid of remote and on-site, 14% uh, maximum remote flexibility, and 8% uh, with a maximum return to the physical office. So uh, interesting stats. Thank you all for uh, your post, as well as for uh, responding to the poll. So um, as you might imagine, somebody who um, wrote a book on, on the top topic, I'm, uh, I'm really passionate about following the media on this. And I get sucked into the clickbait just like everyone else. Um, some of it's good, some of it gets me agitated. That's the reason they want you to click. Um, the New York, the office monsters are trying to claw their way back to 2019. Uh, love that uh, article in the New York Times. Um, pretty much summarized, you know, what the article is about. There are folks who like, hey, I don't like this. I'm uncomfortable with this. Um, especially you see this coming from a lot of leaders. Um, I want people back in the office. During the pandemic, uh, this was maybe late 2020, Microsoft did a really interested peer review study. So this was, this was, this was data coming from Microsoft, but um, reviewed in a very, let's call it an academic way as they looked at remote work collaboration and productivity, they found that um, you know, with the majority of their workforce remote, they actually saw increased productivity, they saw increased collaboration, but the collaboration tended to be with people in work groups that already existed prior to the pandemic and prior to going fully remote and not so much engagement with new work groups. So interesting, um, what do we do with that? The Economist, uh, they uh, publish regularly on this topic. Big takeaway there, most people, most, let's call it employees like work from home and remote work, but, um, and I always do air quotes when I say bosses, because that's a rant of mine, not so much. Um, we routinely see data supporting that what I'll call managers and executives are less comfortable or less supportive of remote work than what we'll, for the purposes of the moment, call rank and file employees. Other articles that draw a comparison between uh, what we might call deep work, heads down work, whatever you prefer to call it, and are those great days to be somewhere other than the physical office because you can really focus and plan your day accordingly uh, compared to days where you know your day is gonna be filled with meetings. And if indeed they're in-person meetings, does it make sense to have those kind of days be on site? A Harvard Business Review um, published an article offering the point of view that uh, remote work should also be mostly asynchronous, which is an interesting point of view. And I reference uh, Matt Mullenweg, uh, the founder of Automatic, which is uh, the company that um, developed and continues to maintain and sell WordPress, the most popular web content management system in the world. Uh, Matt Mullenweg got a lot of exposure during the pandemic talking about uh, the asynchronous uh, nature of Automatic and how they work. Um, another one, torn from the headlines, workers forced back to the office, productivity plummets. Really, um, I, think, I think there's a lot there to unpack, but uh, you know, depending on your industry, depending on your point of view, um, there's data that supports different perspectives. The last two bullets are mine. Um, I believe uh, that the digital transformation that we, the collective we, was embarking upon prior to the pandemic and then accelerated during the pandemic. Uh, and this transition to all remote work and now this interesting balance of, of hybrid, uh, vast majority per your own poll and my own da data surveys, hasn't necessarily changed the structure of how we work, the structure of our days, and it hasn't translated into uh, our spaces. And this needs to change. But first, autonomy, and trust have not necessarily been at the forefront of change over the last few years. And I think this needs to change first. I've, I've done a number of talks on remote work and hybrid work um, the last uh, two and a half, three years. And one of the themes I continue to evolve and focus a lot on was trust as the currency of the hybrid workplace. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about today, although it'll come up. More recently, things that I've been hearing, you know, again, conversations I'm having with people um, hearing about, uh, for example, an insurance company, big insurance company that um, I, I was actually a co-presenter in a webinar early this year where this particular organization talked a lot about their approach to being all in on remote work. They had really 
been thoughtful about this. You know, once the the initial you know pandemic driven transition took place, stepped back and said, let's be super intentional about this. And now the the word on the street, if you will, is they're starting to kind of walk that back. Um, I was uh, presenting on this topic uh, a few weeks ago in Stevens Point, and after the talk, somebody came up to me and mentioned that uh, they had a family member who worked at a biotech in Madison um, with a lot of newer campus buildings. And you know what he was hearing from his family member was that, uh, yeah, uh, the CEO, founder wants everybody back because they don't want to see all this beautiful space go to waste. Okay. Uh, Evan Spiegel, founder of Snap, that's Snapchat, uh, recently publishing, hey, we want people back in the office four days a week because we think this will help us achieve our full potential and potentially accelerate growth. Interesting. Um, you know, again, as I look at what I see in the media, um, I, I have, and this, this is my viewpoint, I own it. Um, I think when you see a lot of the articles in magazines or, or digital magazines like Forbes, Inc., and, and what I'll call you know, East Coast, Wall Street based publications, um, naturally a lot of their advertisers also own commercial office space. And so uh, that's where you see the, the clicks leading to what I call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt about, wow, you know, we really need to get people back in the office because all, all heck is breaking loose. Um, and then, you know, you look at through another lens, hey, if you're invested in built environments, um, you probably feel attached to what you built. Emotionally, you can understand that capital investment. Um, maybe it's a revenue stream for you. Well, of course, that's going to shape your interests and actions. Um, but realistically, let's take a look at where most people are. And I count myself among these people. Um, not everybody, in fact, a relatively small percentage based on data, want exclusively remote work options. Most people want hybrid. And your own uh, survey data just now kind of supports that. Um, but I'm pretty confident that nobody wants to be asked to return to the office because the CEO someplace is looking at their buildings and saying, hey, we built this and I don't want it to go to waste. That's not a good reason to uh, uh, be thinking about bringing people back. So instead, we have to think about what uh, this last bullet um, source cited at the bottom there talks about is the purpose-led office space designed to accommodate hybrid schedules, providing different types of amenities created and in place to help reinforce the brand and reinforce the culture and to foster collaboration and opportunities to interact when people are there for that purpose. And I think that's the, the real distinction. Um, and note, this comes right from the commercial real estate section. So uh, keep that in mind. What we have to keep in mind is that the pandemic changed the game big time. Um, and, and remember, you know, before nobody could have predicted this. So naturally, uh, organizations like insurance companies, biotech, big tech, um, famously the Apple uh, office um, at one, what is it? One infinite something or other, the Google campus. We hear about these other amazing campuses built on the premise that people are centralized in collaborative workspaces. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, despite a fair sizable number of remote first companies, for the most part, there was a broad assumption that what we thought of as work, learning, and commerce happened within a physical space. So all of this building and, and the design of spaces, like, hey, let's, let's make it so people want to be there and they can stay there for hours on end. We'll get your dry cleaning done. We'll feed you. We'll take care of your, your, your family so you can stay at work. Good intentions, but again, the pandemic changed everything. Um, and again, look at it through the lens of, do we want people back in the office just because, hey, we built the space, we want it used? Not a good rationale. In some cases, it's even backfired. And I think it's important that we look at it through the lens of, what, what is the real asset here? Is it the buildings or is it their people? What, in most cases, is... Uh, generating value for the organization. And I would wager in most cases, always exceptions, always specific scenarios, but generally speaking, it's people. And we need to think and plan accordingly. So uh, I took these pictures from the couch. Um, I like to watch Bloomberg Technology on weekends. That's when I you know, um, watch all the recorded shows. And uh, this one made me sit up a little bit on the couch, pay attention and snap these, these pictures. Uh, very interesting as we take a look at um, 
you know, some of the, the uh, items that Emily Chang and Ariana Huffington talked about back in October, the idea that, um, you know, this work-life balance and the opportunity to see stress reduced, feel like uh, people can have their life and work more in balance, enabled by this uh, distinction between um, a fully remote, a hybrid and in-person model. Very interesting in how the return to office trends and then looking at it uh, through the lens of women and particularly women of color. And the, the pandemic had a, a disproportionate impact on women in many different ways. And then as we take a look at this through the lens of women, you know, these flexible work arrangements and hybrid work were indeed a game changer. And then, you know, the idea that um, the schedule in many cases is more important than place. And so that can inform our, our thinking and conversations about the future of the physical workspace. And um, uh, the productivity numbers, again, in this particular uh, survey, again, Bloomberg Technology, employees with flexible schedules reporting 20 time, 29% higher productivity. And again, you know, data can tell you whatever, whatever you want it to sometimes. So uh, all of us have doubtless seen a number of different surveys that show um, you know, different results there. But here's, here's a starting point in 2022. And as we start to think about transitioning into 2023, is that, you know, what are the table stakes here? Um, a critical element, if you're, if you're expecting to win on talent, and despite you know what you hear in in uh, yes the the numbers particularly in certain sectors like technology, big tech, um, and now you're seeing it some in in uh, banking and finance. Um, yes, there's some layoffs, but generally speaking, other data supports that uh, non tech focused industries are happily snapping up those freshly laid off tech workers. So um, it remains a critical element of uh, keeping talent. That's a remote hybrid world. You've got to offer those options. Um, earlier this year, I was in conversations with colleagues who said, we're losing people. We're, we're having people walk out the door because we're only requiring them to be on site three days a, work, a week. But here's an employee or employer in our area who will give them totally remote options, higher pay, and a, a more flexible schedule. So um, looking specifically at people who can indeed do their jobs in a fully remote way. Um, it's tough to make the case that, you know, we require people to only come in the office three days a week. We really need to rethink that. And again, that, that forces us to rethink what we do with the spaces. So as, as leaders, we need to adapt. Um, you know, we need to think about, um, you know, rather than uh, worrying about getting people back to the office, we need to think about how we adapt ourselves as leaders, our organizations, and our spaces for these different ways of working and thinking. And I think it's important as leaders to, um, you know, uh, focus our energy on our value proposition as an organization and the value proposition of our space. Um, you know, again, long before the pandemic, the idea that work was a place that we had to go and a thing only defined by certain start and stop times in a certain place was already outdated. I, I referred to companies like Automatic, um, founded on the concept that place and time is not what defined their, their ability to work. I've shared with you, I spent five and a half years in a remote first company. Our, our teams were distributed across the United States. Our customers were global. Um, we did plenty of work during the traditional workday, uh, but we also had flexibility so that people could work at times that made sense for them and also take breaks uh, to address family needs. So this, this maximum flexibility. Um, the last three years simply reinforced that this uh, is something that's been around and will continue to be around. So I propose as leaders and as organizations, we focus our time and energy on planning for and anticipating change to the definition and place of work and workspaces. Um, you know, get away from the idea that this is temporary. And instead, you know, if we don't want to be trapped by our past rationale and our past thinking of, of physical spaces, we need to look ahead and think about you know, how we reimagine uh, physical space. Again, um, I think it's critical to keep in mind this idea of work as something that you do, not a place you go, isn't new. Um, I've shared my experience. You know, another, another one that comes to mind about 10 years ago, um, I was at uh, North American Global Conference for the Project Management Institute. 
And in one of the sessions, uh, there was a uh, globally distributed team that was doing a presentation and they talked about how they had a team member literally in every time zone in the world. And so work for that company was not by any means bounded by a physical space. Instead, it happened 24 hours a day because of asynchronous work. And I think what this reminds us as I think about that and many other examples is that, you know, somebody's butt in a seat does not automatically equate to engagement or productivity or results. Um, plenty of people, myself included, uh, I say this with all due modesty, do uh, some of their best work when they are somewhere other than in an office space or sitting down in front of the computer screen. In fact, um, you know, my example is, uh, uh, out walking sometimes in the morning near where I live. Um, I'll, I'll be walking and thinking or running and thinking and, and the solution to a problem will come to mind or an idea will come to mind and I will stop and I'll, I'll dictate a note into my smartphone. Um, you know, people who, and again, I did this a long time ago. I did this from 2012 all the way through like 2016, 2017 I took plenty of meetings from my exercise bike and my elliptical. When it was my turn to talk, um, I would just slow down a little bit to catch my breath. Now, the, the question I put out there is, is that work? And the short answer is, heck yeah. Um, you know, again, uh, where this happens um, is not the point. Um, exactly when it happens is not the point. It's the fact that it happened. And we're rewarding the uh, intellectual and creative output regardless of where it happens or when it happens. So again, the physical office space doesn't automatically turn into to productivity and we have to, we have to plan accordingly. We want to focus on productivity. And um, again, I'd quoted that stat, employees with flexible schedules reporting 29% higher productivity, 53% greater ability to focus. Um, and it, it notes place matters, but not as much. Um, sm a small increase in productivity uh, for people who choose where they work uh, compared to their fully in-person counterparts. But again, I, I think the important uh, thing to take away here is that it's really about productivity. And as we think about reimagining work and workspaces and when work takes place, uh, our focus needs to be on that productivity. Um, but yet people, people must gather. I think that's really important. When uh, I, I wrote about um, super successful remote first companies in my book, Remotely Possible, every single one of those successful remote first companies still brought the humans together on a regular basis. Um, automatic, again, famous for having uh, team gatherings where the team could pick the place and they would say, great, we're, we're all gonna gather in this particular city on this date in this place. And they would go there and they'd have a budget for doing that. Um, another company I referenced that brought people together at least twice a year, all hands meetings where people could build that social capital. When I think about other scenarios, um, you know, I think back to uh, time that I spent uh, in the Salesforce ecosystem and being uh, at Salesforce, one of their offices in uh, San Francisco, 2016. And I walk in and I see people uh, sitting around in what almost looked more like a, a coffee shop or a coffee bar than an office space. Um, I'll, I'll bring back, uh, come back to that here in a, in a few moments. But when we think about the physical space and we think about this hybrid option that we all seem to be quite in favor of, we have to keep in mind, it, it's still important. It's crucial to bring, bring people back together periodically. And so when we think about those gatherings, we, we think about how we can be intentional and purposeful about those gatherings serving that, that purpose of, hey, we're not always together. And so when we are, we want to make this a, a, an incredibly valuable time. Back to my cloud craze days, you know, the office in Deerfield that I talked about. Because we were apart as a norm, a remote first company, when we did quarterly gatherings, uh, went into Deerfield and, and gathered in that office space, specially designed for those hyper-productive times, we indeed were hyper-productive. Um, we accomplished a lot during fairly long days and then uh, socializing afterwards. 
reinforcing those bonds as a team that then we took back out into our remote first scenarios. Um, again, highly successful remote first and hybrid companies excelled at this already and are learning how to excel at this. And part of this is one, to rethink leadership, to acknowledge and embrace this and be intentional about this. But also when we have the opportunity to rethink the physical space, we have to rethink it in ways that can support these types of scenarios. And um, you know whether that means you're starting now or whether it may mean uh, as was the situation that I found myself in during 2021, you have uh, a serendipitous opportunity to rethink that space. We need to do so. You know, and it begs the question, what, what is the office for now? Um, pulled, a, a, again, a few more quotes out of contemporary literature. Um, you know, consulting firm in Arlington, the, the general thinking is, you know, come in when it makes sense. You know, that's, that's what the office is, is about now is, um, you know, let's let's take a look at what's an optimal time for us to be here. Not necessarily eight or nine a.m. Because do we need to fight the rush hour? No. Uh, can we come in and then you know have uh, opportunistic collaborative time and then you know get back uh, back home before rush hour? Yeah, let's do it. When we need to focus, remember that slide uh, several minutes ago. We talked about the concept of deep work, heads down time. Um, do that remote. And then when it's time to collaborate, brainstorm, meet, forge connections, let's come into the office to do that. And so, you know, that takes us to another way of thinking. What, what is the purpose of the modern office space? Um, another quote from The Economist, you'll notice a, a pattern here on my part. Um, the office's comparative advantage is as a place to collaborate with other people. So again, what does that mean? Um, spaces intentionally designed to socialize. So I'll take you back to the example of uh, the Salesforce office in San Francisco. This is 2016. They, they literally had a coffee bar. So, you know, you'd see uh, people sitting there, you'd see people sitting on comfortable couches and sofas uh, back to back, but with their laptops out and they're obviously working on the same thing, uh, but just happen to be sitting on these comfortable couches back to back. Other people sitting at the coffee bar, um, and talking, collaborating. Um, elsewhere in the facility, a mix of, of wide open meeting space, but of, of course also some uh, conference space. Not as many offices and cubicles though. What was interesting, and again, I'm, I'm reflecting on this from six years ago. The overall vibe here is a place that people could come not only to work because you know if you're building an enterprise cloud-based uh, commerce and um, you know, Salesforce and customer uh, automation system, you can do that work anywhere. But when you want to collaborate and, you know, have time with coworkers and build those relationships, you come to a space that was completely optimized for this. Uh, really interesting. Again, that's, that's six years ago. Um, I just spoke to this a little bit, but, you know, let me elaborate on this more. Um, when we think about how we reshape the physical office space, I think a, a critical question to ask is, why do I want to be here or there? Why do I wanna be in this space? What, what would be the value proposition for me to be in this space with others, as opposed to perhaps working, you know, in my case, uh, from what is my home office, you know, seasonally decorated, um, a coffee shop, somewhere other than the physical office. There are other opportunities to rethink this. Um, you know, uh, I had the opportunity to redesign my IT space. Um, again, this was pure coincidence. Going into uh, the end of 2019 and into early 2020, um, the area at Madison College where my IT department was located along with our data center was slated for a complete demo and renovation. And so we'd spent 2019 designing space uh, to have about 110 butts and seats and relocate our data center. So we get into construction and demolition and, you know, we get into June, July of, of uh, 2020, maybe a little later in 2020. And I'm thinking, you know, we don't need 110 butts in, in seats. We don't need space for that. Um, I'd already gotten the message from leadership at Madison College that a remote or remote hybrid model was something we could count on. And so it was time to reimagine that office space. And so I was able to get with the construction team, the design team and say, 
look, we need to have a conversation here. One, we can return about 25% of the space to the institution to repurpose. So that's crucial, reimagining the physical space. What if you can repurpose some of that space for other reasons? In our case, it became our esports arena. It's very cool, you should see it. Um, but then we rethought the rest of the space. Um, so look, we're gonna have a contingent of folks who come in periodically. Let's, let's build some hoteling desks, smaller footprint. They're not intended to be occupied by the same person all the time. So you know, people can come in and use that space when they need to. Let's build some wide open spaces. So kind of in the center of the department, we now have wide open spaces with open seating. Some of those couches I referred to. We have some other areas where we can push around very large whiteboards. In fact, you can almost form a temporary conference room with those if you want to. That's what they were designed for. Um, we have another space that almost looks like uh, seating from a diner where you know up to four people can sit in semi-enclosed space and uh, collaborate, eat, whatever you want. So it was a great opportunity to, to reimagine the space um, and, and rethink it. But I think it's, uh, again, it's important to recognize um, let's, let's rethink these spaces as places where people want to come and be, as opposed to, you know, we have to come here because that's where our work is and, and so forth. And it's also, I think, important to reflect on, you know, the idea that, look, we, we can't force collaboration, togetherness um, when and where we want it, and we can't schedule productivity or creativity. We do well to recognize uh, that these things happen at different times and in different spaces. So there's a, an insurance company that I've been doing some work with for about a year and a half. It has a huge, amazing space. It is, it is truly beautiful, um, but it's basically a ghost town uh, these days. And um, one of the last times I was there, I was, I was chatting with a few of the, the folks that I've been working with. And I said, you know, I've got this beautiful, amazing space. Where, where are the, where's the thinking? Uh, on how you're going to use it at this point. And what I was really impressed with, um, they, they shared back with me, like, look, our CEO is aware that there are some other companies in our vertical that are beginning to insist or encourage people to come back to the physical office specifically because they don't want the space to go to waste. And this particular CEO is emphatic that that's not a good reason to insist people to come back into the office. And instead, they too have an opportunity to reimagine the physical space. They have some built space that was not completed. And so you know, their experience over the last nearly three years is going to significantly inform, um, you know, what, am I, what are we gonna do with this? Um, we're, we're going to reimagine it. And I'd, I'd look at um, you know, kind of an opposite experience, um, a different, a company I consulted at a few years ago, this is a health insurance company. They were in the process of redoing some space on uh, the entire floor of, of one of their office buildings. And at that time, they installed desks with a particular configuration uh, that forced people to look at each other. They kind of sat at pods and the way that the desks were set up is they basically didn't have a choice but to, to face one another. Um, the, the stated intention of that space at the time was, hey, look, we're going to take away the physical separation around people's desks because we think this will encourage collaboration. And my point back is that's not something you can force. Um, when you put people in situations where, you know, you, you take away any sense of separation, um, people will do it. I'm doing for a different reason right now. They'll put on the noise canceling headphones. They'll pick up their laptops and go work somewhere else. Um, because again, you can't force and schedule collaboration through uh, designing the space a certain way or um, other. So rethink that. So let's kind of wrap things up a little bit by starting to talk about um, you know, ways um, to, uh, to reimagine the space. I think first it's important uh, for us to accept the fact that whatever we decide to do now, will probably be wrong in the not too distant future. So let's plan accordingly. Um, I've been encouraging people to think about ease of reconfigurability, maximum flexibility now. Uh, my own institution uh, started with a survey. What do people want? People want it both ways. They want a private place to work when they want it and they wanna be alone, but they also want the ability to be flexible to meet and collaborate with others based on their interests and necessity. Um, so again, we have to accept that. Um, 
you know, survey people, find out what their interests are uh, before we start reinventing and redesigning the physical space. Don't start from the interests of the buildings or those invested in the buildings or people who believe that to be effective as leaders, they need to see their people. That's, that's the wrong angle. Um, I'll close and then open it up to questions by sharing a few more space options. Think about you know, spaces where people can be alone together. Think about the, the coffee shop. They wanna be around humans, but not necessarily talk to them. Uh, they like to work in public spaces yet concentrate and then you know, take a break and, and sort of people watch when they need a, a moment. Um, they're around people, but unless you invite a break in the concentration, it's not likely to happen. Other spaces where people by being there are choosing engagement, spaces that signal, hey, if I'm here in this space, it means I'm open to being engaged in conversation and discussion. If I'm sitting here, I'm here because I want you to come talk to me. Spaces to gather intentionally. Uh, that can be used for stand-up meetings, spreading out food, general gathering, uh, what have you. Um, spaces where, again, people may encounter one another uh, unintentionally, accidentally, and learn more about other projects, interests, and so forth. That was kind of the, the Apple and Google model pre-pandemic. There's no question that when people are in the spaces and this happens, uh, it's, it's a good thing. Um, but flip side is you've got to also intentionally create spaces for people to be able to decompress, to step back when they, they've had a lot of that engagement and now they need some time. So uh, different ways to think. I think this is a good time. We got some time left. Let's open it up to some questions if we have any. All right. Thank you, Sean. Uh, again, just as a reminder for everybody, uh, if you do have a question, uh, you can submit that in the chat box or the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, again, uh, the presentation today uh, from Sean is being recorded and will be made available to you within uh, the next few days. Uh, Sean, I had uh, one question that came in. What would you say to company leaders who are expressing their views that their type of work or industry cannot be done from home and that work from home is limited to tech companies? Um, examples might be law firms, engineering firms, architects, et cetera. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a fair question, a great question. Um, my lawyer works from home, so I'll just start with that one. <laughs> I, I know it's a hybrid arrangement. I'll just leave it at that. Um, so let's acknowledge, you know, there, there are some types of work, especially when it requires, you know, hands on the job, you know, those kind of things, uh, obviously don't translate well, but, you know, when we, we talk about what I'll broadly call knowledge and creative work. And so attorneys, engineers, architects, I think that there's, uh, and I, I gave this present a presentation like this, not this one, back in April to um, an engineering professional group. You know, some of the same questions were asked. Um, it, it really depends on what you're working on. You know, and, and there's no denying there are moments where the collaboration is going to be really important. I've got something coming up um, uh, next Thursday where the person who scheduled the meeting said, "Hey, let's do this." remotely. And when I talked through what some of the, the outcomes of the collaboration needed to be, we both said, wow, this is going to work better as an in-person meeting, isn't it? I said, yeah, I think it will. And this is a company that's remote first. Um, but, it, you know, I, I think it's a, a question of, you know, do, it's easy, especially for what I will call, and I've done long, long presentations on this, old school leaders who believe in, you know what, I need to quote unquote, see my people. Um, it's easy to default. Well, our work's different and special. We have to be physically present. I would push back on that and say, uh, if, if you want to create that sort of environment, you can, and you have to be very intentional uh, about uh, creating it and allowing it. So I see another question. I'll just speak to it right away. Um, have you seen when people are in the office, but still sit at desks and cubes and participate in the same meeting? Yes, I have. And when that's happened to me, I'm asking myself, why did I come into the space today? You know, I just spent most of my day um, sitting in my office, um, isolated from others. And other than when I got up and went hunting for humans <laughs> or sat out in one of those spaces where my presence means, hey, if I'm here, come talk to me. That's why I'm sitting here with my laptop, but I, I want to be approached. Um, yeah. And you have to ask, is that 
Is it good? Uh, I'm just putting question out there. Yeah, one more question. Organization with some work not possible. Again, you know, correctional facilities um, is one example. How do we help the organization leadership to be remote first uh, for those employees and teams that are not in the institutions? Uh, you know, again, that requires a lot of thought, um, especially, and in, in, in we've seen this not to the degree that you would, let's say, in, in corrections and others, but you know, look, in, in IT, we have some people who the nature of their jobs is such, look, if you work at a help desk and it's a walk up, pretty hard uh, to, to not be physically, or if you have to work on and repair and maintain AV equipment or you know troubleshoot in the classroom, gotta be physically present. But how can we think about those jobs such that, is there a component of it that can be done remotely? Can we provide some degree of flexibility? Uh, can we take a look at shifts and so forth? Can we look at those scenarios where, um, you know, what if, what if we did a, a rethinking of the first line support such that uh, other folks could spend part of their time physically present doing those hands-on jobs, but then also have a rotation away. Um, maybe one more quick question, and then I'll turn it back to Jeremiah to, uh, to wrap things up a little bit. The well-designed spaces. Um, you know, again, the, the, the one that comes to mind the most for me um, uh, is the, the Salesforce space circa 2016 um, that had, you know, literally the coffee bar type space. Um, I, I can think of a space now in Milwaukee. I'm actually going to start working there after the first of the year remotely and in a hybrid way uh, where they have uh, a gathering place on one floor um, where they have, they've repurposed an old bank vault to be a place where a couple of people can gather privately, but pr very open. And again, my reimagined IT space at Madison College, you know, we've got cubicles and offices, but we repurposed the space to have large open areas where people can choose to be out in the space. They can choose uh, you know, high top tables where they can look out um, uh, across the, the, the campus. Um, and uh, you know, these spaces that can be rapidly reconfigured for impromptu meetings with whiteboards that, that form walls. Those are, those are a few examples. So uh, Jeremiah, I know we're a few minutes over time, so I'm gonna turn it back over to you for the, for the close. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, before we end, I just wanted to, if you want to advance the slide, Sean, yeah. uh, wanted to let everyone know that CPED is ready to help your organization adapt to its culture and physical spaces for new, mo new modes of and ways of working. I would love to set up a discovery session with you to talk more about your uh, options for uh, consulting, coaching, and professional development programming and culture, leadership, or organizational change. Uh, my email is located on the bottom of the slide. And if you we didn't have a chance to get to your question, feel free to reach out uh, to me directly, and we'll make sure to uh, either set up some time with you to, to discuss it further with Sean. I look forward to exploring uh, any opportunities uh, with you and your organization. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar.